Hi everyone, um, good evening and welcome to our second blended generational hangout. Um, this panel is women only tonight and we are talking about the evolution of women in the workforce. So tonight we're going to address a lot of the strides that women have made in the workforce as well as the challenges they continue to face, both at work and also the impact on their lives. So we have here uh, boomers, Gen X, and Millennials, they're coming together, coming together to actually share their experiences. Um, and we're going to question whether or not women are really making significant advances uh, within the workplace and how are they coping today. So we're going to be looking at um, a bunch of different topics tonight. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, the I guess the, the most recent data that I was able to get, and this is U.S. stats from the U.S. Um, Census Bureau, um, was about the growth in women's women and their representation within the workforce. So in terms of um, sheer numbers, um, and we're looking at 40 years between 1970 and 2010, uh, women have actually represented 30 million and have grown to almost 72 million representation of the labor force in 2010. If we convert that to sheer percentages, um, back in 1970 it was 43% and now we're almost up to 58% representation within the workforce. What's kind of disheartening, I was looking at the data as well, is that women continue to be overwhelmingly represented in occupations where there are they are traditionally female roles. So we're talking about dental assistants, we're talking to administrative assistants, nurses, elementary and middle school teacher. And a lot of this is because of the volume. Um, but where we've made great strides um, is in positions like uh, physicians, surgeons, um, the legal uh, the legal professions, uh, police officers, law enforcement, civil engineers, those are those are great in terms of you know where we've made advances, but unfortunately, there are less opportunities in those professions than anything else. Um, from an education perspective, I saw this stat. this is really cool. like almost five years ago, 36% of women ages 25 to 29, and you, you'll you'll like to hear this, Samantha and Tiffany. Um, they actually attained uh, a bachelor's degree, 36% compared to their male counterparts of 28%, right? So we are actually graduating um, in higher volumes compared compare to our male peers. And what's interesting, though, is that compared to men, women still only get paid 78 cents of every dollar paid to men. So I want to tackle not only the pay equity, but some of the challenges that we're facing today. And it's good that we're that we have um, a bunch of different de generations here, so that we can we can take a look at um, you know from your experiences where you know where things have evolved and whether or not you have seen um, interesting changes. And it'll be good from the perspective of some of the Gen Xers and the Boomers, but but also as visibility to to Samantha and Tiffany who are um, actually coming up in the workforce as well. So what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to start with some questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves, state your name, what generation you're from, what occupation you're currently in. Now, if you're self-employed, um, what I suggest is uh, you could reference um, a previous experience where you worked actually in corporate where there was a mix of, uh, of men and women. Okay, so let's start with Tiffany. And so I, again, state your name, generation, uh, you belong to occupation, and, and the generational mix as a percentage of, of men and women within your uh, work, okay? Uh, sorry about that. My name is Tiffany Daniels. I am a millennial. I work uh, currently in communications and community relations within a nonprofit quasi-governmental organization. So lots of fun paperwork and legislation and restrictions and grants and such. Um, as far as the mix uh, in our office, I would say in our small portion, it's probably easily 90% female. Um, and generationally, we have silent, boomer, Gen X, and millennial all represented in less than 35 people. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Okay, Samantha? Hi, my name is Samantha. I'm a millennial and I currently work in public interest research. Uh, all of my coworkers are also millennials but older millennials, so there's about six years between me and my next coworker. Um, and we have, th there's three of us in the office and uh, two of us are female presenting and one is male presenting. Um, I also, we're situated in a university setting, so when I work with administration, then I tend to work with uh, older administrative uh, individuals, often who are female, but that's also the nature of the type of programs that work with nonprofits at the university. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Lisa? Uh, yes, my name is Lisa Thorell, and I, like a lot of people in this group, I have a digital marketing agency in Orlando. Um, in, in this current capacity with my partners and customers, I'd say I give it a 70-30 split, 70% 70 male, 30% female that I work with. Um, what makes, I'm obviously the ancient boomer in this group, and what makes me perhaps interesting is that I've spent the bulk of my uh, technical marketing life in Silicon Valley and Seattle. And during Internet 1.0, which was like the Paleozoic era I know, um, I was a VP of marketing for a startup, and I was the only woman. And then we were acquired by Fortune 500, and there were five more VPs of marketing, and I was the only woman. And then I joined another startup as, uh, and I was one of the founders, and um, I was the only woman. And then we got U.S. venture partners to fund us, and I was the only woman in the room. <laughs> so I guess I've had some big dog experiences. I'm the little dog running through their legs. <laughs> That's great. No, it'll be good to, to hear from you more on because uh, obviously you've been and you've seen the male domination throughout your career, especially in the, the tech space. So I think we want to delve more into that as we move uh, forward tonight. Okay. Uh, Lori. There. Uh, hello, Lori Dillon Schock. I am a Gen X and um, I'm trying to think. Occupation I'm a, uh, the head of planning for a small boutique ad agency that specializes in sort of branded digital content storytelling. Um, I've sort of gone through a number of organizations. I worked at IBM, I worked at JWT, FCB, and now I've landed at this UK boutique. Um, IBM was really diversified, um, there was female executives, there was age range, there was diversity in every way imaginable um, and I spent a good eight years there. Uh, then the ad agency, I would say um, the sort of the younger crowd is in the creative area. Uh, creative tends to be dominated by men. Uh, strategy is a bit of a mix. Uh, account side is definitely a mix um, but it is, it is sort of a young organization. And um, the executives are are mostly men in advertising. So, did you now? You've worked in a couple of ad agencies. Would you say that that was the going trend of, yes. of yes. from a management perspective? Yes. Although I will say that um, JWT president today in Canada is this amazing woman, um, Susan Kim Kirkland, who um, I really loved working with, uh, and so. You know, some tides have turned, and we have seen some female, really great examples of female executives in advertising. But, um, like I would say, on the whole, there's it, there's still an imbalance, like a lot of different uh, organizations. Okay, great, Karima. So, Karima Catherine, um, and as Hesse would say, I'm a confused Gen X, <laughs> uh, but I'm really a Gen X. Uh, with my date of birth. So I have my own digital agency. Um, and now we are two partners, so 50-50, male-female. Um, my, but my partners, my counterparts, my clients, I would say, like Lisa, it's 30-70. Uh, 70 being men, 30 being women. And if it's women, usually they're, in, they're not in leadership positions. Um, I used to be head of social at Deloitte, and over there it was 595. Um, so I would be the only woman in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the only Gen X. <laughs> so we would have a lot of boomers. Um, I was also head of digital for a law firm here in Canada, and um, it was about 30, 70 um, in the room as well from a leadership perspective. And most recently, I, I worked in, at a small agency, but our partners were advertising agencies like. Uh, 
um, Young and Rivikin and uh, Mindshare and others, and uh, the split was the same. I would say 30-70. So you've worked in, in organizations that were, I would say, it would be in consulting, in legal, that were primarily, I guess, I wouldn't say, I'd say male-dominated from a management perspective. Yeah. Um, Partner-wise, what, what would you say the, the split was at the top? Uh, Deloitte was, they, they were really making a con conscious effort. Uh, to have women uh, being brought on board as uh, you know senior leaders and um, partners as well, uh, and they also had their first um, diversity officer, which was an amazing woman um, over there. So I would say still, it still the split was 30-70, and if you were in that 30 percent, you had to negate your. And I think we're going to talk about it, but we, you have to negate that I'm a woman with two kids kind of thing. And I actually met another one. Uh, recently, who who was at the top and who, you know, who almost had to, to negate that side of her life. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, last but not least, Eden. Okay, you'll have to unmute yourself. I know. I was trying to get the little dialogue box. Okay. Hi, I'm Eden Spodak, and I'm at the end of the boomer <laughs> generation. Believe it or not, no. And I would say my experience has been a little bit different. Primarily um, because, well, currently I run a small uh, boutique digital uh, digital consulting agency, primarily around branded content, and the um, associates I work with are predominantly, but not exclusively, female, and our clients tend to be predominantly female as well, with the exception of a tech startup where all the uh, executive team is male, and they still have a pretty patriarchal approach to dealing with things and dealing with women in business. From a corporate uh, perspective, I've dealt, I've worked for a big broadcast uh, company in the interactive department and I've also worked with a financial services institution. And in the interactive side, leadership was predominantly male, although the team was made up of men and women. And in the institutional investment uh, organization, our department was predominantly women because it was a communications and marketing department. However, the uh, senior leadership in the organization, whom we were primarily supporting, was predominantly male. Although, since I left there about uh, was six years ago, things have really changed. The um, market that they serve is predominantly female, and there was a large cry over many years to see more women in management roles, and so that has uh, changed considerably over the last few years. Took a while, but it's it's evolving. Okay, and I think a, a, a couple of you mentioned this already, and I know it, you know the rise of affirmative action so so many years ago to try to create this balance uh, within the workforce. But it seems like even today, and if you guys can weigh in, that that is still very much true in terms of building diversity within within the workforce. Even even trying to um, try to push women more into management roles. Do you agree that 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 is an active that's an active um, role that a lot of companies are taking, whether or not that be government mandated or whether or not that that be the initiative of a company. Do you agree to that? Does anybody? No. No, I don't agree. <laughs> no. Okay. There's there's a the theory, as I said, so a lot of appointed diversity officers, but uh, it doesn't trickle down at all. Um, actually, what I've seen lately, which was really timely that you've done this Google Hangout, is women who feel like once they want to be women with kids, and this goes to what Laurie you just mentioned on the sidebar, uh, as soon as they wanted to be you know, to have kids, they felt excluded from leadership positions, and it's even worse in the you know in the partnership uh, setup. So Deloitte is like that. Um, the law firm I worked at was like that, where I heard stuff like, "Well, if you want to make partner, just tough it out. If you go out and you're gone for a year, a year and a half, well, you know, too bad for you." So there's no like there's. And this is what is weird for me is all of those companies were actually, um, and I'm not saying there's something fundamentally, um, there's something that needs to trickle down. So there's there's a good effort there, 
Um, but I think women are not feeling it. So it's just a bit weird. Lori, you, um, you had something to say about that, did you not? Uh, did you agree? You yeah, well, I was going to say that I, I almost feel like the organizations that have large internal uh, enterprise-based uh, sort of projects may be further ahead on diversity because diversity is, is like sort of a core thing that comes out of sort of this internal organized um, uh, bit. Like IBM was impressive 10 years ago. Um, but I still don't see that across all the the industries that I work with. And I, I, I mean, in ad agencies, you are all part of a massive network. Like, it's, it's a large organization, but on the individual um, company level, there isn't the same sort of priority placed on diversity. Uh, yeah. And I look at diversity in a very different way. Well, I look at it as a woman, but I look at it also as a minority, like a woman of color, which, to me, I always see it in different ways. Um, so, yeah, that's another... So, so maybe my, my discourse is probably biased to I'm not only talking as a woman, so I see it as, you know, with another layer as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that, that ends up being a separate hangout because there's, <laughs> there's so much more on that as well. Um, can I hear from Samantha or, or Tiffany uh, from your perspective? Because you're, you're younger and yet you're, you're also dealing with startups, so... So back in the days when I worked in tech startups, of course I'm using back in the days because I'm so old, um, I, I left it because it literally was just a, a, a giant like circle jerk for guys to talk about how great they are and how innovative they are and here I am like trying to change how we're doing a social media presence only to watch it disappear and you know, slowly crum crumble to the ground as soon as I leave. Um, and I, I think it hasn't, it has not changed. And I, I think there's there's a really great protest sign that I saw and it was this woman dressed in Victorian clothes and she had a sign that says, I can't believe we still have to protest for this stuff. And it literally makes me think that when I'm listening to uh, talk, topics of being like diversity too because I'm often the only like minority person in a room too so I get pulled with the two cards. And while I currently work within an academic setting where we do have a lot more females who are in academic roles or um, in positions of leadership than, than in the past, it's still predominantly male. As, unless you're dealing with the nonprofit streams, which I get to work with, which is great. Like, yay, because it's a, considered to be a feminine job. Yes, exactly. Um, Tiffany, do you have anything to say about that? Um, uh, yes, I have worked in roles that are traditionally female, but our management has always been lopsided as far as gender. So in PR, very, very female heavy, very, very female dominated. But when you looked at the leadership structure of our firm and the other national firms, it didn't match the lower level entry. There was some fast track, it appeared, for a lot of the, the men. And working for a chamber of commerce, very similar. Um, the support staff was very often female, but even my manager, who was amazing and did a wonderful job, was always very, very conscious of what she expected the male business owners to expect. And so there were times where members of our team that had the expertise may not have been the members that actually participated in a conversation because they were anticipating a male preference. Is it so it's not... It, it, I'm sure it's gotten better, and I'm not to say that anything is, you know, I don't, I didn't experience the workforce prior to 10 years ago, but in the situations that I've been in, it's still very much a joke, um, and there's a lot of female managers who have reached a point that they find as their success, and there's not opening the doors for others, it's ensuring that they are yeah. the amazing person who happens to be a female instead of kind of a mentorship type situation or, or development process. Totally. Now, has anybody else worked in government like Tiffany or, or not-for-profit where they've seen that? Have you seen, so you've seen that as well, Samantha? Yeah, especially it, it, when you're looking at lobbying institutions. So I, I can show you tons of pictures of me in lobbying organizations or in lobby meetings and, you know, there's two or three girls and the rest are all male, right? Like, it, it's not, I still, my closest friends are part of a group that we started that was, like, female lobby, lobby, like, people because that was it. Like, you got to find the people you know and hang out with them because no one else is going to get it. Hmm. 
That's interesting. I um, Lisa, I want to talk to you because I mean, from especially as a woman who's worked in technology and having had to be the only women woman among men, um, especially in a tech environment, can you can you relay what that experience has been and whether or not you've seen any changes over time? Well, um, I wish I could say that I saw more changes, but if you take a look. My anecdotal experiences are one thing, but you know, before this program, I looked into a few stats, and from the Women in Center of uh, Centers for Technology in Silicon Valley, and here are three stats that just say it all. If you look at the number of women in technology who leave, 56% of them leave before their career, you know, in the middle of their career, and that's about twice the number for men. They just don't leave like that. And some of the other speakers, you know, mentioned child rearing. You know, this is kind of an issue um, or a conflict. Um, here's another stat: if you look at technology startup funding, 92% of the money is going to males, and females only grab 8% of that technology startup money. And the last one, which is kind of really amazing, because it's a, a 2014 summer stat from a, a professor out at UC Santa Barbara. She looked into the diversity and the gender balance at Twitter. Facebook, Apple, and um, if you look at the techn technical positions, only 20% of them are women. And as you go up the ranks from director to vice president, the, the number of women, as many people here were saying, it drops precipitously. These are all recent numbers. So my ancient history is one thing, but I'm aghast. I'm, I'm totally disgusted <laughs> that that's where we're at. Yeah, well, one thing that um, I can say as somebody who's worked in technology for years, um, we're still seeing women in technology that are in traditionally female roles. Like we're in marketing, um, we could be in HR, we're, we're in, let's say, business positions. But then when you look at, let's say, CIOs or CTOs, they're still very dominantly men. And where I've seen, let's say, women in those roles, they find it very, very, very difficult to actually coexist, um, especially when a lot of the people that are reporting to them are male. Have you seen that, Lisa? <laughs> I love seeing that. going. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, everybody, I think here wants to go like this, right? Because yeah. if you've had male reports and you're, and everyone here has reported to a male. It's bloody difficult, and it's funny. I'm sure many of us have read Sheryl Sandberg's book, but my reaction to that book, as much as she did great things, I think, in bringing out some issues, was, man, this is super white-gloved. She's so polite. I saw some really egregious things going on. I mean, physical activity. I mean, we're, we're seeing it online with a lot of the uh, you know harassment stories at GitHub, but... Um, Listen, there's some really nitty-gritty, awful things that just don't get discussed. That's interesting. Um, Eden, I want to hear from you because you you actually, um, you're a teacher as well, a part-time, uh, I guess, educator. And a lot of the, the stuff that you teach are, are also, um, it's also involved in emerging technology. So t talk to me about the students that go to your class and like the, the I guess, the mix of men and women um, for example, and, and their expectations, especially, in, in this emerging workforce? Sure. I would say, you know, it's very interesting. I teach digital strategy and emerging technology, as Hesse has said, um, and it's continuing studies, and the students range in age from 20, from about 22, so they're recent university grads, all the way up to mid-60s. That's essentially who I've seen. And although we tend to see more females coming through the program, the number of males are growing. One of the observations that I've made, in, and this, this discussion really brought it home, was that there's some incredibly competent, bright, talented women that come through the program, and yet they tend to have less self-confidence or be less boastful about their abilities and capabilities in comparison to their male counterparts. So there are some men who speak very well. They're incredibly articulate, but when it comes to seeing the work that they do, the way they speak isn't reflected in the work. Whereas I see almost oh the opposite in yes. women. You know, and in women, and it's a horrible, it's terrible that I'm saying this, and, yeah. and this is gross generalizations. You don't see it, you know, in every case, but 
generally speaking, there are a lot of women who really doubt their ability to perform well, and yet the quality of their participation in the program and the work that they submit and how they function in group work is stellar. And yet, you know, their uncertainty is you know, all across the board and I spend half the time building up people's self-confidence because most of them are, are studying an area that's new to them or, or um, somewhat new to them whereas uh, others may be more confident and going into the program just to get re the recognition of a certificate but um, they just you know they say well this is all new to me blogging is new social media is new Digital is new, but I need to integrate it into my business, but I'm not sure I know how to do whatever yet. When it comes to the soft skills that they bring that are, um, uh, I'm, I'm stuck for a word, the transferable skills, they've got all of those. So it becomes, you know, that much easier, I think, for them to, to do quite well, and, and they're always full of self-doubt. Doubt. Is it, so let's talk about that because... There, I know, but... No, that, that's what no, I, um, I think it's important. I think that you've hit on an important point because I think um, I saw a lot, a lot of people nodding, especially Karima and Samantha. Oh, I'm, I'm jumping up and down. I'm like, who's <laughs> right now? I'm like, but this reflects social media as well. Who gets the big speaking gigs? Who gets the books? Who gets the this? Who, and when you look at it, who does the work? I mean, you know, I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm just, yes. So but I, I, is is it a so there there's this it, they always talk about perceptions about you know if a woman says it then the perception is X if a man says it right then it the perception is Y and what I'm trying to figure out is why is there a reticence among women why is there a self confidence issue, issue especially when it comes to technology okay Samantha. There was a study done about the perceptions of men when they're listening to females in a room and if more than 30% of the room is female and they're saying something, they're going to take it as they dominated. 30% is considered to be domination. So I mean like, of course we're going to need like someone to say that your, your viewpoints are valid because we're so used to people being like, you talked for so long and it's like, excuse me, you've interrupted me every single time I've said something here. So yeah. I mean... I'm not going to go into like discussing like patriarchal views of society, but I mean like it's there. Yeah, uh, Laura, you you actually brought up an interesting one because this is recent. Uh, what what um, uh, what was his name? Eric Schmidt. Eric. Yeah, that's uh, right. From Google, what did he do during that conference? So the Google chairman is Eric Schmidt, and uh, he was called out for in, um, interrupting uh, Carissa Bell. Um, I think it's no wait. So the funny thing is, I have a hard time knowing who he interrupted because, you know, this is this is an article about him interrupting the female panelist, but all the news media never named who he was interrupting. I don't know if that was doing her a favor or not, so it's hard to know who that person was. But anyway, I, I mean, I think Google is called out for having some really great diversity um, practices, but it's obviously inherent in you know, today that, that men interrupt women a lot. And I've seen a lot of articles where women, the three things they can do to advance themselves is, one, tell everyone to stop interrupting them, two, lay claim for the idea that was your own, and then I can't remember the third. <laughs> okay, so let's speak to personal experiences because if that is one of the things that what's happening I guess from from your perspective, let's say in the boardroom and at work, that that that's challenging for you today. Actually, I like in in advertising because I have, and I'm sure um, a few of us have this because I have some knowledge power. Um, I'm I don't have a when I'm on a roll, I don't have an issue in in the boardroom. Um, where I have an issue is is more around things like um, people booking. You know my evenings. Um, you know my my. You know we'll do this offline or after work, and not respecting the fact that I'm a committed mother. And I've actually used those words at work in my last role, saying, you know, I am actually a committed mother. I can't meet with you eight times in one month in off hours, which I was asked to do. Um, so, um, the, but that could be a hindrance as well. Oh, right. it's a big hindrance. It's a big hindrance because 
those off hours were to talk about the strategic direction of the agency, right, from a digital standpoint. So here it is, suddenly I can't actually participate in those, even though I'm the director of the department. So it's really very awkward. Yeah. Um, we got around it, we rescheduled, rescheduled the meetings for the morning, but um, just having to stand up for myself. Oh, one more thing. Um, interesting story. When I was at JWT, um, we had won the Mazda account, and there was two digital strategists, and I wanted the car account because um, the auto industry has traditionally spent more on digital advertising than any other industry. And so when I went to my male boss at the time, I said, you know what, I want to be on the Mazda account. And he said to me, sorry, it's a guy thing. <laughs> So oh, I, I can relate to that because when I was working for Ford, wait, wait, just I was back, just a sec. I went home <laughs> and I came back in the morning and I went to my boss and I said, Okay, you're handling Canadian breast cancer and <laughs> you're handling Canestin as a brand. So if you could do boobs and vaginas, I think I can handle a car. <laughs> I love that. And I Laura, got you're it. my hero. I got it. <laughs> what did he say to that? What did he say? Okay, it's yours. Oh. And you know what? Like, I don't feel like he was being, like, I don't think he was consciously aware of the decision he was making. But when I reframed it for him, he, he, like, he totally got on board with me handling NASA. And I think that's the challenge. It's sort of like if I were to come back to the Google chairman, I'm sure he was appalled that he had that behavior. But until someone calls it out, you know, a lot of men aren't aware of it. That's what I think is happening. Anyway. Um, I, I want to hear from, from Lisa, because I'm sure you have these stories. I'd love to hear some of your stories, actually. But I, especially as a woman, and, and I, I've experienced myself in tech, but I mean, because I, you have seen it. You have seen it a, a couple of times, especially as a, a, a manager, a VP, etc. What challenges have you faced especially earlier on when you know it, it was more of a it was more of a challenge for, for women to even be in the kind of role that you were well um, I should say that I entered the high-tech workforce um, out of graduate school you know I had a I have a PhD in neurophysiology in a, which is a technical subject and so um, I'd kind of been trained in the lab which was all it <laughs> to go to the board and write my thoughts down and participate collaboratively with men and so it was not such a huge transition to go into the high-tech marketing world of Silicon Valley and go to the board like not to be afraid, go to the board and participate, learn all that technical vocabulary, draw this box and this arrow goes into this you know, decision tree, I mean to just uh, share with them ideas, I mean it, believe it or not I, I think the point has been made here by uh, other people that women are sometimes too intimidated to stand up and go to the board and draw, you know, demonstrating that they're thinking, you know, that they're on top of the subject and not only that they're producing right then and there on the fly that that would be that helped me and I would advise people to take that step is it do you think the intimidation comes from um, male do, uh, a predominantly male dominated environment or or could I mean or is yes Samantha says yes it's but so it has nothing to so if there were if there were let, let's say if you you're competing against other women there would be less issue with intimidation that's what you're saying I think, I think it's a different environment I mean like I think one of the things that due to the nature of some of us trying to get into these spaces it, of course there's going to be like gossiping or things like that that happen but I mean I have never experienced in competitive female environments someone like literally talking over me and telling me that my ideas are not valid that's never happened. Where I've had that in male dominant spaces. I've heard like at the water cooler, like, oh my goodness, someone said something about you later on. I'm like, whatever, like I, I can deal with that. But I've never had someone shoot me down hurtfully and intentionally to make sure that I don't talk again. Okay. Now, Tiffany, you work in an environment where um, there's predominantly female, but you, you're saying that, that the males are the ones at the helm. Um, have you witnessed, have you actually experienced anything like from a, a challenge, have you experienced specific challenges uh, with having a manager that, do, do they treat, let's say, women fairly at the, at the boardroom table? 
Um, yes. Uh, my current organization is male-dominated. Our executive director is a male. Um, but out of the other 35, there's only three other males on staff. Um, so our leader and our CFO are male. And then every other leadership position is held by females. But by previous organizations, pretty much 100% of the top management was male. And then you would see the trickle-down effect. Um, but I have seen... In, in a similar instance in the case that sometimes people think that they're helping by not putting you on an account that would be considered male. We had that at the PR firm, but uh, I mean essentially because we didn't have that many men, they had to at times put us on accounts that they probably wouldn't have should, if they'd had more options. And our clients, to my knowledge, you know, never had any concerns. They really just wanted the quality of work. It wasn't whether it was a female perspective or a male perspective, it was were they going to be able to increase their sales. In my experience with the Chamber of Commerce, sorry about the dog, that was far more traditional business. Every, you know, suits and ties and, you know, our HR manager wanted the women in pantyhose every day. So the experience there was a little different um, because no matter who we were meeting with, there was this idea that it was going to be 1965. Even though the companies we were meeting with might very well be coming, because I'm in Austin now, so we were heavily recruiting from Silicon Valley, heavily recruiting from the East Coast, heavily recruiting from Seattle, and in those areas it's a little different than the Deep South that we exist in and the Midwest. But we were very much in the 1965 Deep South Midwest expectation of business, and that's not who we were dealing with. So they found it actually sometimes off-putting that there wasn't more diversity at the table, whether that was by, you know, mm. gender or ethnicity. Okay. Um, what, what about Eden? Um, you, you wrote something here in the, the chat about an issue that, that you had dealt with at an agency. Can you expand on that a little bit? Okay. There we go. Oh, the agency one? Okay. In an agency environment, um, not so much a male-female issue, but more uh, just being told that if we ever had any issue, if we ever were really excited about wanting to work on an account, or we had any issues ethically or otherwise about working on an account, so either end of the, the spectrum, we could voice our concerns and we would be respectful. But when push came to shove, um, assignments for who was account lead and the account teams were either ec generally economical or seniority decisions made within the organization. So, so it was, was okay. So not, you know, not the equity that we talked about. But I don't know if you saw, I made a, there was another interesting point, um, if I may talk about a current situation that sure. I have with one of my clients. I work with a, a, they consider themselves a small business. I think they're more in the medium size, but it's, it's a family business. I work, actually have a couple clients in family businesses that are quite diverse from one another. But I work with one where the women, woman business owner is probably more the most senior in the company, and yet she's the only female on the management team and has been like that for 20, 30 years. And she, I'm the first outside confidant slash marketing person slash wear of many hats they've ever worked with on a long-term um, subcontracted basis. And part of the role that I serve isn't as much being uh, somebody who helps consult on the digital strategy side as somebody who can be a confidant who's female and outside of the existing management team because she just finds that she's not being heard or understood in the same way uh, internally as she would be by another woman. And the other women within their organization are in very administrative roles. And she finds even with her sales team, who she's not related to, but all technically report to her, she has a hard time having herself heard. And with product that she champions, it's been a tough slog until she could show that uh, things that she brought into the company and really championed were um, had, a, had a great future in terms of sales. She wasn't even listened to. So she doesn't have anybody internally that, that, that will help champion her, even like an internal mentor or no. Oh, no, she's the senior she's the senior female. She's the senior person. Are you guys finding the same thing? And I think that this is this kind of segues into into the whole thing about like networks and mentorship and actually finding women who are in the like positions that that um, maybe they can't do anything for you internally, but they have they have a voice. They are, they have an ear for you. 
um, they've gone through similar things and I know there are a lot of networking groups out there especially for women in technology that allow women to actually just network with other women for the for the purposes of just sharing experiences do you do you have or have you um, experienced any of those types of um, I, I don't know networks or as as Eden says is it like do you have someone that, that you can talk to that that'll actually help you um, in your situation yeah yeah uh, for myself I I don't have necessarily female specific I do have uh, women I can turn to I think the rise of the book club for many of us are, are is a place a safe place for us to talk about um, careers but also health and other things but I also have uh, you know Hesse and I belong to something we call the cat's pajamas where it's it's it is completely diverse age gender well not so much age age gender race where we all talk about um, the challenges or um, digital uh, in general and and I get a lot of advice from there yeah Thanks, Holly. what about uh, Samantha yeah uh, we call ourselves the dream team we constantly talk to each other we have a very long group chat that we started based on lobbying groups so when I was in a students union we were like the four and then there there might have been a couple like other grads within it so like basically we we just kind of hung out and we we're talking about like oh I'm in a meeting and no one's listening to me and often we were the majority of us were staffers um, so that means we weren't elected student leaders we were staffers who were hired on to to do the work and so even now like you know a kid later a marriage later uh, a bunch of stuff we still talk to each other we still are helping each other with our roles so it's uh, it started with something that was necessary to be like I can't believe no one's listening to my idea it's fantastic yeah you're right this is actually like valid information and now we just continue on with each other's lives as as we tend to grow within the jobs that we're in you know, you know what's interesting. Like as you're talking, and and I remember what we were saying um, rich, uh, um, initially earlier in the hangout about about the disparity even among startups, like the the people that you do business with. But you know, among millennials specifically, the the actual wage gap is is actually smaller than it is on average. So on average. Women make 78 cents for, for every male um, dollar, but for millennials, it's actually 85 cents. So that gap is closing a lot. So from from either purely an educational perspective, or maybe I think maybe a growing acceptance. I hope. I think um, I think I think it's an acceptance. I honestly think that people can get sh like it's almost like a shame to be like, oh, we don't want to be like those companies. We're a startup. We're cool. We understand what's going on. So we're gonna try and be like equity based. And then the problem that you'll see within startups is actually getting into concepts of equity. So like, who gets what part percentage of shares, and who gets like access to stakeholder relations, and who gets into these things that are a little bit more higher up and less. Uh, about the hourly wage or starting salary because those are good stats to use when you're looking for funding. Right. The only difference is representation again because you're still seeing what 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 percentage? Let's say 80% men, 20% women and even I'm not sure if the, if it's even higher percentage, but I mean that's interesting to know. But um, I was re I reading also some, Yeah, go ahead. I'd also just like to say I not hate to be a pessimist, but I am. Um, millennials are also still lower levels so the gap may be smaller in the entry-level jobs but when we look at the data for who is being promoted and what the salaries are across those lines it actually starts to separate again yep I'm with you on that one okay statistically that seems right so you agree with that Lisa oh yeah yeah as it okay so Let's talk about like one of the issues that it, that exists today, and maybe I'm not sure, but is it a boomer thing? Is it an older mindset that doesn't seem to want to die about the like w when we talk about the wage gap, when we talk about women in in management positions, is that still that's still around? I mean, you have to you have to admit a lot of the the boomers or at least male boomers still control a lot whether or not it's in government, whether or not it's in big business. And so um, old habits are hard to, to die or die hard. Do you agree with that? I heard um, recently a Catalyst study 
um, and they actually said that uh, the millennial, um, so they were talking about perceptions on women and work and, you know, places of women in leadership. And I was really surprised because apparently the millennials have worse perception on women than boomers. So the new generation actually is not better off. Um, really? Yes. And I was actually, before the chat, I was trying to find the, the numbers for you just to give those. Um, I haven't been able to find them. I've actually uh, shoot an email to Catalyst just to get that because it, it was in the, I was driving and I was listening to this and I was like, oh my god, so we're never getting out of this. <laughs> it's, yes, it was shocking. I'm, do you, um, I want to talk to Samantha or Tiffany. Do you, believe, do you agree with that? Do you think, because I, I, I mean, they say that millennials have a higher degree of tolerance and, um, and, and perhaps there's less discrimination at that level, but, not, but from what we're hearing, that's not necessarily the case. I think it depends on what industry you're talking about. Because, like, honestly, if I'm talking about the tech industry, uh, it, it's rifled with awfulness. If I'm looking at, like, startups that are, like, based on... You can smell them. You know it. You, like, you can smile, smell it a mile away. Like, this is not going to be a place where I'm going to be considered a valid voice. Well, there, there are plenty of other groups that are, you know, maybe not as monetized or a big within the in, like the industry so they're not getting the same viewpoint so I think those who have power will continue to to fit within certain power structures right yep um, Tiffany I want you to talk about what you just said in chat about women and traditionally aren't as bold as many men who ask for raises I will um, not generalize an entire group but I will put myself in this role um, regardless of how um, proud or capable I may think I am. I am the type of person as many women that I work with and friends and family that expect or hope that promotions and raises will come when your work is recognized rather than taking it upon myself to ensure that my work is being recognized to catalog it all and then to go in and ask for the raise or the promotion that I feel I deserve based on my experience with this employer. Um, I've seen that statistically, I've seen it personally. Um, I know a lot of guys who are maybe not as capable as they are able to convince people, but they have the confidence. And a lot of times, um, in, in the types of roles that I work in, so not very highly technical, obviously you need to be able to prove that you can do what you say you're going to do, but in more community relations, communications, relationship-based um, organizations and, and roles, I know men that are just full of themselves and that confidence and that whatever other words you want to add to it depending on if you like the person or not works for them. I don't know as many women that are able to toe the line between confident and bitchy mm. and that's not my definition or theirs, it's whomever they're working with. Um, a douchebag still gets promoted, a bitch doesn't. So. Not, sorry to curse on the, on no, the hanging, no, no. but I mean, there's there's something about that that it's you still accept this kind of sleazy person, but a confident person is different. Okay. Um, so there's that piece, and yeah. then I know it's on the other end, but there's also that line when we were talk, talking about the traditional um, either silent generation or boomer kind of male ego role that there's an expectation for women to be charming and nice, and there's a line between charming and flirting that heterosexual men don't have to con concern themselves with. Okay. So you also have this other end of the spectrum that can hurt most women. Yeah, and that's the hardest. And trying to find that part that's accepted and not... Everybody's going to be judged regardless, right? Mm -hmm. But women will be judged, judged more harshly. And Laura, I want you to talk about this because um, this this plays into you know let's say situations that you've been in especially dealing with male male bosses right and and this idea of promotion and and what's the perception at, at when a woman comes to the table and and it is a little bit more confident and bold about things yeah like, um the it's funny that I would say the best race situation that I've been in is when um, my equal decided to leave and before he left he was um, offered um, to match, they matched, you know, wanted to match his, his new salary. 
and he left anyway, but he coached me on on what to do. And I marched into um, my boss's uh, office and I gave him um, a really big number. I said, I want you to look across the table at someone who's been here longer and raises more revenue and I want you to give me what you just offered him and if you need a number and I landed <laughs> a fucking ridiculous number and you know I got a third and uh, and it was like the first time I thought, I also thought for the next 24 hours it's going to be fired and I, I always get to these points in my career where I think Fuck, I'm going to get fired, I'm going to get fired, I'm going to get fired. And I go through this 24-hour period of thinking, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> but anyway, it usually comes out all right. But it's, it's when I've been sort of assertive in the way that, you know, my male colleagues have sort of coached me in uh, being a, assertive. I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question there. No, no. Um, but, but I think we're all like that. I mean, I'm the same way. I, I mean, I, I don't know... Um, you know, starting my own company and stuff, and and in a lot of ways, like you have to you have to hide your own you know insecurities and and, and show a different face. A lot of women, I, a lot of us still wear our heart on our sleeve as hard as it is. Men are, are I think maybe it's easier for them to hide it and to be and to be that confident. But that there's always an expectation. Remember that that's how they're reared. That's how they're raised. And and maybe it's it's a function of upbringing. Do you guys agree, uh, Lisa? I mean, this is especially especially when we talk about let's say STEM roles, right? And upbringing, like why do why are women more aligned with the traditional female roles? Like there's a comfort level there, right? There's a reason why things are happening the way they are naturally, don't you think? Well, you know, it's funny. I was going to bring up that we've in this discussion had a lot of uh, emphasis on the role of men to keep their power that there may a lot of this situation is being perpetrated intentionally or on purpose unintentionally by men but what's spooky is that um, women is, is there's some if you're if anyone here is familiar with the unconscious bias studies that have come out um, basically with in, in a nutshell if you take two resumes, make them very identical, they're identical, One's, except one has the name, you know, Kirk, and one has Jill on it, um, and then you show these resumes to people. They did this in academia, right, where meritocracy prevails. Um, the professors looking at them, the male named resume said he was twice as competent as the female, and, and it actually gets worse when they kind of age those resumes, resumes to say, should this person be promoted? Um, and this is this study was replicated again in 2012, um, and it's it's frightening because here's the key: when you look at women professors that were included who were looking at these resumes, the same bias. They expect the female to be less competent. We're less willing to give her, uh, you know, more salary. It's so that's very key. Women themselves seem to be part of their the perception problem. We're doing it to other women. Hmm. Uh, please, please make comments. I mean, this is totally scary to me, but it is. There's increasing data on it. In fact, some of the big companies in Silicon bias training because of this. I've worked with women who who value being the token, and any challenge to their role as that single female that will always be called on and, and showcase diversity and forward thinking is, is hard for them because they may be very, very capable, but they unfortunately have a belief that they may be in that position because they are a woman. So any other woman coming up challenges that single position that they expect is, is available in that organization. So it can be a challenge to encourage those that are above you so that they can encourage you because I know women that don't expect there's going to be more than one space available. Yeah. Well, particularly with speaking spots, right? Oh, yeah. Have you ever been asked to be on the panel? You just All you have to do is like, oh, I understand what's going on here. You're missing a woman. <laughs> well, and the last one I was asked to be on, I was replacing a male. Yeah. Yeah, but I always take those. That, I'm happy to be the token because I know what it's like to be in the audience and I, every time I'm at a digital conference, I look at that panel, I think, why the heck are there all men? Yeah. Like, where's the women? I have stopped going to those. Yeah, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah. 
That's the problem. Yeah. Me too. Um, well, if, if there's only men on the uh, agenda, I, I don't register. So but. what's interesting is of the one of the first links I, I gave you um, way up at the top of the chat session was um, there's uh, music festivals are being called out because most of the performers are men. Uh, and I wonder if, you know, women would elect, would they ever elect to attend a festival because the lineup is not sufficiently balanced? I don't know. You know, um, I <laughs> can I do it here for a second? No. This is really interesting. I was thinking about how things impact my current business, although I'm in a small organization now. When I've been on new business, and it's me and or my team, people are always trying to see if they can um, I don't know, negotiate a little bit. And I don't, I don't negotiate my fees. My fees are my fees. When I negotiate with an associate of mine who's male, we go in with a higher fee and no one ever questions it. And coincidentally during this talk I just found out that we want a new piece of business. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Oh, I hate that. I, I know. Isn't that crazy? I, and it's a, it's a substantial difference. So they're getting the same, you know, essentially the same person with the same qualifications. But when I go in with a female team, and when I go in with the male, a female male team, I can charge different amounts depending on the gender divide. I'm wondering if there's a perception when it comes to negotiation and the fact that, I don't know, if it were a male and a female negotiating a rate, then it's, it's almost this, um, what's it called, uh, power, easy power struggle where a man will say, well, I can, I can definitely like win her over and she, she'll be able to take whatever I give her, right? And I've been in those situations where you negotiate, um, but the minute I do it, um, you know, it, it ends up being more of a battle. But then the minute my partner comes in, he ends up winning it every single time. And I don't understand that. I'm starting to think that, that, that there is this, this perception out there about that. So. Um, so we don't. We only have three minutes left. I wanted to get to one last question, um, if you guys will allow me. And this is this is something that Lori touched on earlier about um, being a female and being a caregiver, whether or not it's your parents or whether or not it's your children. For the most part, even though there have been increasing um, representation of women in the workforce, we still are the primary care caregivers. And yes, there are males, a very small percentage of them that, that will be like stay-at-home dads, but still that's not, and they're not necessarily sharing 50% of the household uh, responsibility either. So for those that, that are in this situation, um, does it impact your job? Um, does it impact, more importantly, does it impact advancements or, or opportunities? Because Lori talked about that as well, right? She has her, her time with her family, and then sometimes that time where she's away from a discussion where there could, have, there could be like extreme bonding or whatever going on, um, it's a missed opportunity for her from an advancement perspective. Lisa, what about you? Unfortunately, um, I, I can't answer that question. I didn't okay. have that conflict. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I, I, I talked to Samantha and, and Tiffany, but I, I know you guys really don't have kids right now, so and you're not taking care of anybody except yourselves right now, right? Except your husband. Uh, Karima, you have kids. Yes. So, and you worked in an environment where... Yes. It was very stressful, male dominated, etc. And then, but you're also a mom. Yeah. So was that was that a hindrance for you in your job? Well, let's say that, um, like the whole Gen X label, I've never let any label stop me. Otherwise, I would basically stay home because I have the longest name ever. I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm a mom. I'm this. I'm francophone. I have an accent. Uh, so I just say the hell with it, and I just go and do my thing. And if nobody's happy, well, that's their, really their problem. Um, but to be fair and to give a very serious answer, I've worked four years in a very well more than that, 19 years in in the workforce, um, almost 10 in highly stressful environments. Um, and last year, I quit my job, um, and I said, you know what, I'm going to give my kids and my family a chance. Um, but it was a double chance. I was giving myself a chance to fulfill a dream, which is be my own boss, 
but also be more present uh, at home. And uh, the way that it was pinned um, by my bosses when I told them I'm leaving to, you know, to be more present with my kids, the email that went out to 500 people was, Karima is going to take care of her family. And I went, wait a minute, that's not what I said. <laughs> I'm not being a stay-at-home mom. I'm, you know, I'm being more present. So, so it's, you know, I kind of given up on the perception of others and just focus on what I'm doing right now. And um, it's 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 the best thing I could have done. So I'm not regretting. You know, I want to interject there a bit. I w there was one point that I put into the comments, but um, I worked at an agency where everybody at the VP level uh, was either a ch a woman without kids or a man with kids uh, and a stay and a wife who was a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. And I decided to leave the, the agency because I found I really wanted to give more to my family but have more balance because I was spending 16 hours a day working, yeah. essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And so when I said I was going to leave and they really, really wanted me to stay and they said, oh, well, you can work part-time, you can do this, you can do whatever. and you know, regardless of what went on, and I said, no, I'm, I'm sticking to my guns. What was really disheartening was the number of young women who came into my office and said to me, you know, I really understand why you're leaving. And they were all 20-somethings. Um, we, I really understand why you're leaving. When I was a kid, my mom was always at home. And I think it's a really sad statement on society where we have these women who were all university graduates and working uh, very bright, starting their careers and thinking, you know, I'm here until I ha get married and have kids and then I'm going to stay home like mom and I don't know how people can be home at work. And it was quite disheartening and, you know, I made sure to tell them that I had always been a working mother. <laughs> My, you know, this wasn't just a new thing that I was doing and, and testing out and it didn't work. This was something that I had been doing for, um, at that point, I think 15 years. <laughs> Yeah. I have to sound off and support. You know, you know it drives me nuts. And this is not a gender related thing. There are so few people in my career that will freaking stand up for what they believe in, right? Like so I worked at an ad agency where um, interns were paid 700 bucks a month. And if you work that out, that's like 5 bucks an hour. That's 35 bucks a day. That's less than what you can uh, survive on at McDonald's, right? And I made a really big stink about it. Um, uh, and the attitude is interns are lucky to get the job at an ad agency, and I, I don't believe that at all. So, um, but here's what's interesting. When I challenge the CFO and I challenge different people, they all said the same thing. You know, I've always wondered about that. You know, I thought the same thing. And there's so many people that don't stand up for what they yeah. bloody well believe in. And it's not like, it's not a gender thing, it's not, it's just, it's like systemic. And yeah. um, part of this sad thing about you leaving Eden is that you were standing up for something for those women, but those women didn't feel the permission to stand up. And, and I'm sure there's other things people aren't standing up for. But um, yeah, in the old agency I worked with, there was probably three of us that would be willing to sort of stand up for things and uh, sad. Yeah. But it's the same thing for racism. So I'm going to close that with a very sad statement, but I was in a meeting with 15 people and somebody, you know, the senior person looks at me at one point and says, hey, um, did you ever think about playing basketball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? And I go, am I supposed to laugh? <laughs> um, and actually somebody else called them out and it's I've always been in this situation where you know people and nobody said anything except for one person and uh, you know and so systemic yes yeah, there's so many you know yeah. things we can fight for yeah um, well, for, my, for me it's going to be diversity I need we need more people like me you know young old you know that's yeah. what I'm gonna, that's my fight well, one thing I, I want to close with, especially when, um, especially from what Eden was talking about, and, and this is really sad because I worked at agency as well. Um, when you when you're an agency and you talk about the women who are at the top, a lot of those women are yeah they're either single or divorced. 
um, or or if they have had had kids, you know, their home life is pretty messy. Um, it's kind of sad in a way because um, for women to think that in order for them to succeed, to be at parity with men, they have to sacrifice their own happiness in order to do that, and that includes marriage, that includes kids. And then when they go home, they go home to nothing, which is which is a sad state of affairs. Well, we're trying to have it all, and yet we're we're you know we're we're dying here. We're trying to be the chief household officer. We're trying to be the the, the woman who who does a lot. But some of us are are also blessed to have husbands that are willing to take um, you know half the responsibility so that we can do the kind of stuff that we need to do. So anyway, we're over. I'm wondering if there are any um, uh, closing thoughts because this is a great discussion. I think the one thing that I want to do is hold another one uh, specifically about women in tech uh, because I think that's where a lot of the, the issues rise. And as, as, as we get into more of an economy where technology becomes more of a focus, it's going to be, it's going to be something that um, the, I guess the working technology industry is going to be uh, challenged with. So anyway, with that, thank you ladies for coming and uh, very fruitful discussion. So what we're going to do, it's Samantha, you have another one tomorrow for boomers, right? What's the, what's the topic? We're focusing on family life and technology, so if anyone is interested. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to stop the broadcast. Thank you very much for coming again, and um, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.